Okay, guys, this is day two of industrialization and labor. Let's talk about some of those labor strikes. We saw yesterday about uh, some of the problems that labor had organizing. Let's say get it going. So the first major strike is going to be the railroad strike of 1877, which makes sense because uh, if you're on the railroad, you can spread the word from the city. So what had happened, um, the railroads had cut workers' pay by 35%. They were working now 15 to 18 hours a day. They took away their perks, um, which was free rides, and the word spread from city to city. So this is going to be a coordinated strike, and ultimately at the end of the strike, over 100 people are killed and 1,000 are jailed, and these are uh, union strikers that were that were killed and jailed. Now we're stuck here. Okay, why are we stuck? My recording stop. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is just some uh, examples of the, the news they talked about in Baltimore, how they called up the National Guard, and 10 strikers were killed, many more wounded. Uh, then President Hayes ends up sending in troops uh, to Baltimore to quell these disturbances. In Chicago, terror reigns the streets. In St. Louis, uh, they had the militia called out. Ohio, um, Indiana, Illinois, Chicago again. Uh, the miners and steel workers came out in solidarity, and they said 20,000 surrounded the roundhouse, 5,000 of them armed. They exchanged fight, fires and, I mean fire, and this was this is going to last all night long. So how in the world do you break these strikes? So uh, the basically the corporations, the companies had. All these these ways they could do that. They would basically just lock up the factory, and they could afford it. And people could not afford not to have a job. So this was called a lockout. Um, they of course had the yellow dog contracts. They could threaten to um, let jail workers that struck. They would hire people to break through the picket lines, and they called these workers that uh, would come in scabs. They would make blacklists so anybody that struck would have difficulty finding a job down the road. And then they hired Pinkertons. Pinkertons were uh, a detective agency, but they were hired by these um, corporations to put down the strike. And they were known as strike breakers. So you can see this was their motto, we never sleep. And they would come in armed, and these altercations often ended in this is a cartoon you see quite often. Um, I'm going to give you some cartoons to analyze. This one's pretty easy. I mean, you see on the right-hand side a uh, worker, and he's kind of the Don Quixote, uh, small, you know, when he, Quixote is fighting windmills, this is the same kind of thing. You see all the workers in the background here on the right cheering him on, but they're fighting uh, these fat cats, if you look on the far right, these little rich dudes, and they are powerful. The, the, this represents the railroads, this huge horse, and uh, even though they have the numbers, um, they don't have the strength. Corporations also went over un after union leaders. This is um, the leader of the Knights of Labor, Terence Powderly, and they basically are saying, hey, you workers are, are paying in and he's living the good life. So uh, the union leaders making lots of money, 5000 a year, versus the average worker who is making three and $400 a year. So this is Terrence Powderly, Knights of Labor, and yes, he does have a little booty chin there, but he is going to be the head of the Knights of Labor, which is going to have a membership of over 700,000 people. The Knights of Labor was open to everybody, uh, any skill level, and they believed in arbitration. So know that arbitration basically is negotiation, uh, going to these corporations with their demands, with their wishes, and trying to work something out. 
Ultimately, the Knights of Labor will fail. Uh, they'd had some organization problems, and it was perceived that they were making unreasonable demands, things like a uh, five-day work week and a eight-hour day. So this is the symbol of the Knights of Labor. And this is going to be the downfall. Okay, so Haymarket Affair, a couple of union leaders, I mean union members, had been um, shot at and killed. And they call for this mass meeting. They're going to actually print posters in different languages. You can see here it's in English on top. Good speakers will be present to denounce the latest atrocious act of the police, the shooting of our fellow workmen yesterday afternoon. They're telling the working men to arm themselves. Uh, they have a poster in the morning and then in the evening you can see it's got Achtung, it's got in German on the bottom. So, um, bright crowd and you can actually go to Haymarket Square, they have a plaque up there in Chicago. And a great crowd comes in and uh, the leaders are supposed to speak and a bomb is thrown. Uh, to this day, no one knows who threw that bomb, but seven police officers are killed. Four workers are killed, and many are injured. So what they, what the law enforcement does, they arrest the union leaders, and they try them for inciting a riot. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? But in this particular case, they are going to find them guilty, and four are executed. This is one of the officers that was killed in the explosion. And the people of Chicago are saying these, these union leaders are anarchist. They are promoting violence. And the public is not backing any of these, these uh, union leaders. Four of them are executed. Uh, the other ones are actually um, imprisoned and fined. This is going to completely break up the Knights of Labor. Their, their leadership is gone. Uh, Powderly was not one of them, but their leadership is gone and the Union will disappear. Another case of violence where a strike is concerned is called the Ludlow Massacre. This is in Colorado, and um, it's a mining community. They had company housing, and when they go on strike, they get kicked out of that company housing. I encourage you to hit this link, and it gives you some more information about Ludlow. But when they were thrown out, they uh, pitched tents, and to keep the wind from tearing through the tents, they actually dug themselves in. They dug uh, into the ground and had the tents over them. Uh, owners called in the militia, and the militia ends up burning all these tents. In the aftermath, 12 women and children are killed, and 20 people total are shot and burned to death. This is a scene after the massacre. Sadly, if you look at the ages of the victims here, you can see uh, four years, six years, 11 years, whole families, the Petrucci family, four and a half, two and a half, six months old, the Valdez family, uh, the, the mom of 37, eight years old, seven years, three months old. So this is a plaque at Ludlow. This woman is going to be a union organizer for 50 years. She's lost her husband, who was a union organizer, and children to yellow fever. And instead of going into mourning, she said she got to work. After Ludlow, she said, pray for the dead, but fight like hell for the living. She was known back in the day, you know, the women wore those big old hats, and they had hat pins to keep their hats on their head. They would stick them through the buns um, on the top of their heads. And she would pull that hat pin out, and she used her hat pin as a weapon when she got into skirmishes um, as a union organizer. Today, uh, if, if any of uh, your people are in unions, they usually get a, a magazine, and it is called, named after her, Mother Jones. 
So as all this is going on, uh, remember you're having kind of a communist revolution going on as well. And the industrial workers of the world are going to be formed. They, if you remember, I think we'll talk about Marx, but Marx uh, is writing about workers of the world uniting and throwing off their oppressors. And the IWW will be organized with that premise in mind. This main union, which is still in existence today, is the American Federation of Labor. This is a craft union. Basically, if to be a member of this union, you have to have a skill. Back then it was skilled white men. Now it's anybody with a skill. As a matter of fact, the teachers union is um, under uh, the AFL. It's going to join with the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Um, now it's a part again. And this is called a bread and butter union. They're basically asking for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. They're going to, with because of their strength of numbers, they demand higher wages, uh, reasonable hours, and better working conditions. That's it. Three demands. Very simple. Eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, and eight hours for recreation or whatever. Okay, so they call that the 888, the eight-hour day. This is a, a political cartoon, and this is uh, Samuel Gompers. You can see the big fat corporate cats here worth 50 million dollars, and uh, the wants and needs. Okay, so it's going down to a dollar a day for your worker, and basically, this is this is a, a political cartoon showing what what workers need and what workers deserve. Okay, if you look at this. This is a difference between a craft union and an industrial union. Um, industrial workers of the world, the IWW, um, skilled and unskilled, includes everybody. It's an international union of the IWW, which means worldwide, of course, and uh, they would strike during wartime if they needed to. Their leader is going to be a guy named Eugene V. Debs, and we're going to be talking a lot about Eugene V. Debs. Samuel Gompers, we've talked about uh, him being the leader of the American Federation of Labor. So again, another uh, political cartoon, and this is um, Basic, you wanted a leader, the Labor Agitation Orchestra on the Go As You Please plan. And you can see that if, you, if you're reading through this, for the improvement of the laborer's condition. And here is Samuel Gompers. Okay, so know that this is the first modern day union, and it is still around today. So let's talk about some more of these strikes. The Pullman strike of 1894. Now the Pullman strike, Pullman is a railroad company. And they made all the railroad cars, the luxury cars, the uh, cargo cars. It was a huge, huge business. And um, they are going to go on strike and the rest of the railroad industry will go on strike with them. You can see it used to be kind of nice uh, if you had the money to ride on these planes. They had a recliner here, they had dining cars, they had a bar car, they had art, and Pullman would, uh, would make these cars. They also had a their own company town. Okay, and we've talked about company towns. They, if you were working for Pullman, you were required to live in the company town, uh, shop at the company stores, go to the, their children, went to company schools if they weren't working, and they even had company churches. Looks like it's pretty nice there, doesn't it? But of course, the workers paid for it. This is from, uh, yeah, we are born in a Pullman house, fed from the Pullman shops, taught in the Pullman school, catechized in the Pullman church, and when we die, we shall go to the Pullman Hell. 
So we talked about Eugene Debs before. Eugene Debs is the head of the American Railway Union, and he is in charge of the strike. Two-thirds of the workers walk off the job, and because uh, the railroads at this, this point in time were uh, carrying the mail, Grover Cleveland issues an injunction. Okay, an injunction can be issued by a mayor, a governor, a president, when they determine that the common good is, is hurt or threatened by a strike. And basically it says, you got to go back to work. We will arbitrate, try to come up with a solution, but this is a federal order, a government order, and you have to go back to work. This is the first time that a federal government gets involved with a strike. Debs refuses. He is thrown in jail. And this is going to be the first of many times we see Debs in jail. Seven workers are killed, and ultimately the strike is broken. You see Pullman here, and he's basically crushing his workers with low wages, high rent, and it says the condition of the laboring man at Pullman. Eugene Debs is reading Marx while he is in jail, and when he comes out, he is going to become the leader of the American Socialist Party and an advocate for the IWW. Kind of a handsome man when we see him later in life when he's running for president in 1920 he kind of looks a little like Skeletor but he is going to be around for a very long time. Takes it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court actually approves putting putting uh, Debs in jail. They say uh, under the Postal Service law, interstate commerce because the the trains are going from state to state and the general welfare that the injunction should have been recognized and it was okay to send Debs to prison. He is going to become a very, very famous socialist leader. And this is showing him running for president from jail after he protests uh, World War I. And he spends a little bit of time in jail there and actually gets over a million votes while he is in jail. Okay, next strike we'll talk about is the Homestead Strike. Hopefully most of you watch The Men Who Built America. And this is where uh, in Homestead, Pennsylvania, Andrew Carnegie Steel Mill and horrible conditions. He, they go on strike. Henry Clay Frick is the manager there, and he is going to call in the Pinkertons after he initiates a lockout. Uh, then scabs are trying to go through this picket line, and the workers hang themselves. So you can see here, uh, protected by the McKinley Tariff and a Pinkerton army. Again, the government is backing these um, corporations, and the Pinkertons are there uh, to basically protect, huh, to um, defend the corporation. So it breaks out into violence, and in the skirmish, 16 are killed, 23 are wounded, and it is called the Battle of Homestead. Ultimately, Henry Frick is, um, there's an attempted assassination, and he basically is a beast, ends up, uh, attacking his attacker. So this is just basically showing uh, major strikes around the country. You can see even in Louisiana in 1887 there was a sugarcane worker strike. Um, 50, I mean 30 people, mostly African Americans, are killed in this strike. This is just um, west of Baton Rouge. And we have them um, on Idaho, Ludlow in Colorado, a textile strike um, up in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and 40 hungry strikers and children are beaten and one is killed. So you can see uh, around the country, the one thing that is common with all of these strikes is violence. So it's not all dismal. I mean, during this time period, thousands and thousands and thousands of patents are issued 
for amazing new innovations and innovations. These are, this is just an example of some of the things that are invented during this time period. There are half a million patents issued between 1800 and 1900. Things like the zipper, um, the radio, the elevator, Otis elevator. Uh, now you've got steel to build high buildings and you've got the means to build them tall because now you have an elevator that can take people up. Levi's blue jeans, um, the light bulb, cash register, and so forth. So we're just going to talk about a few of these inventors. Uh, first one's Isaac Singer, and Isaac Singer there, he is, he is going to be the inventor of the commercial sewing machine. Uh, Howe had made a, I'm sorry, Howe had made one for in, industry. Singer is going to make one that people can have in their homes. And remember, you know, you didn't just run down to the store and buy ready-made clothes back then. People, women, actually sewed for their family and made their clothes. And this is going to make it easy. Uh, they had a, a pump down there. Ultimately, when electricity comes about, they'll put a little motor on the side there. They'll move that but the small one is only going to be $12. And you can see this happy woman in the middle. She is there advertising and saying, now I can sew my clothes in half the time. So this was a, a fantastic new invention, $12. And uh, now women did not have to do all that hand sewing. Alfred Nobel is going to invent dynamite. And ultimately, because of the an explosion in one of his factories, and then he sees it used as weaponry. He is going to develop the Nobel Prize. But he does develop this, um, and it's going to be used extensively in the um, building of the Transcontinental Railroad. So a lot of good. Before that, it was nitroglycerin, very unstable. Now he's, he's making what he considered a safe explosive. Alexander Graham Bell, we know very well. Alexander Graham Bell, of course, with the telephone. And he was actually experimenting with um, ways to enhance uh, sound for people who were deaf. And this is the first telephone. Don't ask me how it works. I have no clue. But people didn't believe him, you know, so he used to put up these demonstrations. This is showing uh, uh, Boston, a big auditorium, and he has somebody... Uh, call someone in Salem and basically they speak to one another and some people thought it was ventriloquism and they would put relatives back and forth to that only they would know certain things and they were amazed it was like a magic trick and of course this is Thomas Edison and we'll be doing a little Ed puzzle on Thomas Edison uh, known as the Wizard of Menlo Park. He is going to actually create a factory of inventors in Menlo Park one of his many inventions, uh, the and of course the first incandescent light. And he it took him thousands of tries, and every time something didn't work, he'd go, Success! I have found, I have eliminated yet something else that does not work. So he did not see failure. Uh, movie motion picture camera, and this is Edison with his phonograph bringing music to the world. And then, of course, Henry Ford is going to revolutionize the automobile business with his movable assembly line. And so someone would stand at the same place and start out with a chassis and just move right down the line. And this is going to make an automobile affordable for workers because they can crank them out so much faster. Love to have one of these cars. So he is going to uh, create his Model T, his famous Model T. And he said, told people that they could have them in any color they wanted as long as it was black. And then we have in 1903 the very first motorized flight in Kitty Hawk, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright. And this is going to lead to a revolutionary uh, industry and um, of, of flight. We're going to have fighter planes actually uh, in World War I, in 1914. And this is uh, 
Orville and Wilbur. So you can see uh, labor, industry, banking, oil, we're going to be talking about this, this uh, time period and all of the things that combine to make it what we call the Gilded Age.